Hey, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for joining. Um, my name is Nick Olmsted. I am a senior systems engineer at Arctic Wolf. I'm based out of uh, Denver, Colorado. I've been with the company for about two years or so now uh, in the industry for almost 20 years, actually, um, at this time. And um, I'm you know, looking forward to talking to you guys today about our security operations report. Yeah. Hey, everybody. I'm Oscar Meeks. Uh, I'm the director of technical services and solutions for FR Secure. Uh, approaching about two years here as well with FR Secure. Uh, oversee all of our penetration testing services, uh, as well as our digital forensics and instant response team. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to having some good dialogue with you, Nick, and uh, hopefully give some value to our attendees. Exactly. And so the format for this uh, webinar today is just going to be a dialogue between me and Oscar. We're going to be reviewing the Arctic Wolf Security Operations Report that was released recently. It's our first annual report which how we comprised of the data is we took up our 2000 plus customers and, and did a review of all the different security incidents that we've uh, performed and investigated on their behalf and, and put that together into a report of uh, six kind of key findings that we've found through January 1st of this year through June of this year. And so that's what we're going to be, you know, kind of diving into each of those kind of six topics and then what are the trends and, you know, what, what, what have we seen kind of happen during, you know, this COVID era and hopefully, you know, we'll be changing in the, in the post kind of COVID world as well, or staying the same as we kind of, kind of get through this uh, discussion. So let's, uh, let's kind of get started. Um, and so what the first kind of key finding that we found out of this, and again, this is across, you know, our 2000 customer base. And one of the things too, maybe just to take a little bit uh, step back is um, Arctic Wolf has uh, two security operations centers, um, one out of Provo, Utah, and one out of uh, Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. So we say we're North American based. There's about 150 uh, SOC analysts between those two locations, um, you know, that, that deal anywhere from just uh, triage, triage incidents to doing incident re, uh, response to doing forensics to diving deep into particular products. Um, and, and also we have something called a concierge security team, which are assigned engineers. So this is kind of the findings from, you know, all of those different groups uh, of, uh, of different people and across again, that, cus that customer base. So let's jump into it. Our first kind of key finding um, that we've seen over the, you know, the first kind of first half of 2020 is uh, account takeover attempts. Uh, we actually saw a pretty large increase of uh, uh, account takeover attempts of, of increased of about 429% over the last, uh, uh, I think about since March is where is what we had on had on here. And, you know, one of the things Oscar, I wanted to ask you on this is, is what have you seen like any like, have you have you guys seen an increase from your customer base or um, you know, especially since for, you know, people are working from home on, you know, attempting to, you know, do business email compromise or, or anything around that, that side of the house. Yeah, it's been a pretty interesting pattern for us. And we have seen an uptick, uh, particularly near the end of Q3 going into the beginning of Q4. And it's kind of interesting. You guys are on the socks. So you're probably on the front line of more detections and me doing incident response. We're on the back line of those people who do get uh, victimized by those account takeovers and then discover it when the attacks uh, present themselves later. Uh, we were expecting an uptick exactly in line with the statistics that you guys put out because, you know, one of the things that we talked about internally was as soon as this happened with the shift to home for a lot of users, I expect to see those account takeovers rise. And we expected an early spike in clients, partners, and uh, folks who need our help in responding to those incidents. It was kind of delayed though, which was a really uh, surprising thing to me, but it, it probably goes in line with a lot of things that you guys observe as well. When we look at standard dwell times, right? Uh, just because the attacker is able to successfully take over those accounts doesn't mean they action that. And we identify a lot of times there's been a significant dwell time for those accounts that have been taken over. Uh, but yeah, I can certainly agree with that in the last um, two months, especially two to three months, we've seen a significant uptick in a, in um, incidents that have resulted from an initial foothold through those account takeovers. Um, seeing just continued targets on all those things that we, uh, you know, continually tell people they should be working on. But we've seen, you know, folks this year, um, a little more so than before, who have those uh, remote capabilities for, um, you know, business email through O365, uh, through VPNs, uh, with web logins, 
um, through remote desktop servers, Citrix environments that are still authenticating using single factor authentication. Yep. Um, you know, we've that's been a pattern for us for years, right? We know that those are always susceptible and a heavy target for our attackers, uh, but we've seen more so as more and more people have shifted to using those resources. Uh, there's just more fruit for the attackers. And so, uh, yeah, they're definitely going after it. That's for sure. Yeah. And we've been trying to hypothesize a little bit on like what has changed and why is it such a giant increase? Because you know, passwords have always kind of been the single weakest link, right? Because it involves us, you know, a, a, as part of that security control. Um, and, you know, one of the things that uh, has been kind of discussed is potentially now that we're working from home, we're getting a little lazy um, on, on reusing passwords. Uh, we're not in the corporate environment. And so maybe users are, are deciding to, you know, reuse some corporate credentials across some of their personal accounts. Um, and you know, one of the things we've just been kind of emphasizing back to our customers is just you know, uh, enforcing or at least discussing you know password management tools. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe even providing those for free for personal use and for uh, corporate use. You know, maybe two two separate vaults vaults that you have or 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 something like that. Just the um, just to make it easy, right? Because we all like to take the path of least resistance mm -hmm. uh, on, on this and just try to make it a lot easier so that we have stronger passwords, right? I mean, yeah, I think there's a couple things that play too, like going back to, you know, what caused this. And one thing that I think about before um, is we may have had, say, 25% of our workforce that were utilizing those remote access tools, right? And yeah. now we're probably at more of 80 to 90% of our workforce that's utilizing those remote workforce tools. And when we think of common attacks like uh, credential spray, right where we know a popular password that has been used just by increasing that population from 10 to 20 percent to 80 to 90 percent is going to significantly uh increase my chances of having a successful password spray using that one password so i think yeah. that's into play and i also agree 100 percent with you that um as folks shift onto those uh remote management remote access systems uh, they're essentially bringing their bad habits from their personal use into a business environment. And so if we aren't focusing on educating our users into understanding what a strong, secure password is, how to implement those policies, not reuse and so on. Uh, yeah, it's just a huge risk for everyone. And I always say there's a big difference between enforcing a password complexity group policy uh, and actually implementing a secure password because we can have and we and we guess them all the time from our red team uh, exercises passwords that meet complexity requirements, but they're very insecure. So we can't rely on implementation of complexity requirements to equal security because it absolutely does not. Yeah. Yeah, no, I can, I can see that. I can think of a few passwords myself that yep. <laughs> could easily just <laughs> get hacked, but yep. uh, excellent. So what we wanted to do next is we have a quick poll um, in this wanted to, we're going to send that out and give you guys a minute to respond to that. And while we're doing that, yeah, here it is up here. So what is the biggest cybersecurity threat do you see to your business today? And you can While we give everyone time to answer yeah. that, Nick, if you don't mind, I did notice a very important question in our chat from Ken Johnson uh, asking about my favorite sipping whiskey. Nice. Uh, I can personally say my favorite sipping whiskey is hands down uh, Wild Turkey Rare Breed. If you've never tried Rare Breed, I'd put it on a list. It's usually easy to find and it's a, it's a nice price, about 40 bucks a bottle. So <laughs> just 120 proof just be be aware <laughs> yeah. it is barrel proof yeah <laughs> barrel proof it's it yeah i have had that though it is good get a little bit of fire in the back yeah. but you know yeah <laughs> yeah i love that rare breed or the turkey flavor profile in general with that heavy rye nice. and uh mix that with a, a barrel proof and uh it goes nice by a campfire on a cold night i'll say that <laughs> for me i've been getting getting into our uh, four roses uh um, yeah uh, they're uh small they're batch select small batch that? select yeah exactly yeah. that that's it's a big difference between their normal um oh yeah it's phenomenal. yeah i couldn't believe it i was like wow this is like two completely different flavor profiles but yeah very very good yeah that small batch selects one of my favorites too and if you ever come across any of their barrel proof single barrels pick them up you know they've got i don't even know how many different uh mash bills that they use now yeah uh, but they've got some really interesting unique uh flavors in those barrel proof uh single bottle pours Excellent. Perfect. All right. So we got our results from the poll here. Fishing, number one um, concern, uh, followed by it looks like ransomware, then malware, password attacks, and DDoS. 
Well, that follows very closely to um, what we've been seeing um, from our report here. So the, going into kind of our second, uh, second item is, uh, is actually around when attacks occur. And we'll get kind of into the phishing here actually coming up. Um, so what we've seen from our, our SOC report is we've seen attacks occurring actually during after hours. 35% um, of all attacks that we saw in the first you know, six months of this year happened between 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. Um, with actually breaking that down even further, majority of the attacks after that then happened like right at 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. and right at like 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. So right at the beginning and end, end of the day. Um, and so we found, found that, you know, pretty interesting. And, you know, we kind of dug into that a bit more. And obviously, you know, they, uh, attackers, if they, if they can get into your environment and your tools can alert on that, but you, you're not able to respond to that in, in hours, obviously that gives them a lot more of a window to be able to do, you know, be able to, you know, potentially, you know, get in through that credential spring or get in through that brute force attempt that they've been trying over and over again and trying to figure out when your accounts are going to lock out. Um, how, how have you guys uh, seen that, Oscar? How, any anything from uh, you know yeah. doing pen testing, like attacking them at different times of the day, and yeah, we can see specifically from a blue blue team perspective, um, mirroring what you're saying a whole lot there. Only from the incidents that we've worked specifically, if I'm talking to like let's dig into ransom events, and everybody's concerned about ransom right now. Um, it's more in the 80 to 90 percent of all these ransom attacks are getting kicked off overnight. So they they and weekends too. We see the weekends overnight. The prime time, attackers are smart. Um, as much as we want them to be dumb, they're actually pretty smart people, and they do dumb things. But <laughs> it's a different story. Yeah. Uh, but they are as smart in profiling businesses and understanding uh, when their greatest chance of success are is. And it's exactly what Nick got to, you know. And it's not only those security alerts, right? We see a lot of al other alerts uh, that are typically involved in that kill chain. Uh, for example, when you kick off a massive ransom attack, your SAN is typically going to go crazy. CPU util utilization is going to go through the roof. Disk ops is going to go through the roof, and those are things that this admin would pick up on. They're not going to see that because they're going to be at home asleep at the time. Uh, the same thing for the security alerts. Once they start that, you know, heavy recon and enumeration of the domain as they posture to deploy the ransom, they're going to do that stuff overnight because they know most of those security alerts that are going to be firing and triggering. Um, chances are you're not going to have a security admin uh, on board unless you're working with someone like Arctic Wolf, who has, does have 24-7 SOC capabilities. A lot of our businesses, though, are small to mediums and aren't particularly doing that today. And yeah, those attacks uh, are, are kicking off when we're not here. Um, attackers, uh, they know their greatest chance of success, I believe, is by hitting us uh, when we're going to be away from the screen 24-7 or, or from a full-time workday. And that's especially with ransomware and potentially like, you know, brute force type of attempts. But one of the things, you know, uh, like people responded with is phishing is, you know, a big concern and also like one of the largest, largest attacks people use. And they actually need you guys to be in office for mm -hmm. that to occur. So that's, you know, that's kind of a little bit of the difference on, on why the percentage isn't as high, I think, during after yep. hours is because yep. phishing is one of the largest things and you actually need users yep. to participate in that. So, yeah, I think to break <laughs> down those statistics, exactly what you see, we see the initial foothold is usually uh, attempted and successful uh, during standard hours. Uh, we see that that final step in the kill chain, which is typically going to be the ransom event, Halo, those yeah. typically kick off, you know, in non typical business hours. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, what can you do on this? I mean, being able to staff 24 seven is obviously would be ideal, but obviously is something that is difficult, you know, to obtain for, for most people. Um, but, you know, being able to, you know, having on-call resources, you know, you know, being able to prioritize the different tickets, the ones that, you know, you do maybe need to get woken up in the middle of, of the night for, um, or using, you know, a service that does help you provide 24 seven coverage, you know, or a couple remediation items. Yeah. Another thing items. I would add, add to that too, uh, those are definitely good points would be yeah. also like making sure you have a good incident response plan and you know uh, yeah. that you're going to be able to action that because the last point in time you want to test your incident response plan is in the middle of the night, in the middle of an incident. And so there's a lot of value in going through those steps beforehand. So you understand the triage process, you understand who's going to be engaged, how you engage those folks and get them on board to, to respond in the event of an attack. Um, because, you know, we talk about this all the time, minutes matter, hours matter, and how quickly you can engage can make the difference in if your entire architecture is encrypted, or if only a piece of that architecture is encrypted. Uh, so having a plan, 
is a big piece testing the plan as well alongside with uh you know having proper monitoring proper proper alerting and then having those partners to supplement the things that you just don't have the capabilities to do today yeah exactly um yeah you definitely don't want to be testing in the middle of a crisis right so yeah, <laughs> yeah that's not 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 what you want to do and then i see we got a question that that's that revolves us is um, do the attack do the times for attacks also correlate to time differences between us and other nation states that typically have this activity uh for the arctic wolf's uh, stats we have majority of all of our customers are headquartered with either either within the us and canada so they're north american based they do have you know international type of types of, of locations and obviously they're getting attacked from potentially from nation states or just you know from different hacker groups or or individuals um but yeah this is so this is going to be basically us time-based Mm -hmm. um stats that that we have right now um yeah. so it, it is they know our hours they know our business hours here in the u.s and that's when they're trying to trying to attack us is when we're not there or when we are there in the case of fishing right so yep excellent thanks for the question there um and so i think we're gonna move, move on to our second poll here how many alerts on average do you receive from your security stack so meaning you know from your different products how many are you dealing with? Um, I guess maybe on a weekly basis, I probably should have put a basis on here, but um, I did not. But I did see a response to, oh, the Portwood. Sorry, we're going back to whiskey in between while we're waiting yes. on the poll results here. 21 year old Belvini Portwood. Yeah, never heard of that, never tried it, but I will definitely put it on my list. Nice. To get a sip. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. Bootlegger 21. I'm going to put that one down too. I'm more of a bourbon man. I, I've, I've not heard of either of these, but uh, I'm a man of many tastes. So I'll give anything a try at least twice. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Two times because the first time you probably didn't do it right. You know, <laughs> that's right. I know. Excellent. So majority of people less than 100. That's what I kind of expected there. 100 to, to 538 percent. And then we do have a few a couple of you that have over, you know, 500 or so different uh, different alerts. And, you know, these kind of stats can can be different, too, depending on how much how, how much you have tuned your different products. Um, and, you know, yeah, basically how much you've customized it, tuned it and, you know, how how many of those alerts are actually coming through. But, you know, as we can see, there there are a lot of, of, of alerts that we're, we're all trying to deal with, trying to prioritize on top of our, our typical day-to-day -day routine from, from these different products. Um, and that does, be, that does come, um, and actually I'm gonna switch things up uh, on you a little bit, Oscar. We'll talk about, a little bit about alert fatigue next. Uh, just, I didn't have my, my questions lined up with our, with our topic. So something I'll, I'll write down and <laughs> adjust for the next one. But um, that is something that's pretty big from um, across you know, at least the Arctic Wolf customer base. So uh, like, like I mentioned a few times, we have about 2000 or so customers. Um, we're getting about 100, 100 billion log observations fed into our platform every single day. So, you know, logs from your endpoints to your firewalls. And then um, those are, um, you know, those are all turning into lots of different alerts that our customers typically, you know, had to go and spend a lot of time uh, reviewing. Um, so if you are, you know, dealing with hundreds of alerts per day, um, you know, you, you what what we've seen and what I've heard is that um, you know they, they just become noise a little bit, right? And especially if they're maybe just getting emailed and they're, they're getting thrown into an email folder, and you just see them time and time again. You know, okay, that that's really nothing. It's it's just false positive, just a false positive. But you don't sometimes you don't quite know if that really is a false positive without doing that investigation um, into those uh, different alerts. So is that something you guys have seen on FR at FR Secure? Is you know any in, anything or kind of around that alert fatigue and yeah, it's a common recurrence. And yeah. so what I mean by that is a lot of times we're in there post fact, right, when the incident has already occurred. And so part of our forensic investigation is always to determine that point of ingress and how the exploit happened and look for any artifacts that may have existed beforehand, clues uh, to lead us down the path to identify those exploits. Um, a large part of the time, we are able to retrace the attack, identify that initial point of ingress through looking at logs they already had and they weren't looking at right and so 
you know, obviously I see it a lot with endpoint and some more and more like EDR and endpoint solutions are becoming sophisticated and more difficult even for some consumers to properly manage those and review those. Uh, we see the same thing with next gen firewalls, right? Um, same thing with, you know, the VPNs hosted on there, but what happens most of the time is it's a set it and forget it top exercise. Uh, clients will install these with the best intentions of properly tuning, properly setting up monitoring, but we all understand that resource constraints and time is an issue. These take a lot of time and it's constant too. It's never a one-time exercise. It's not a static exercise. It's always a dynamic exercise. And so we see often they had tools they had purchased, tools that were in place, uh, but for one reason or another, uh, the constant review of those logs or the tuning of those uh, technologies fell on the back burner. Uh, and then we come in, you know, very often we're able to look into those solutions and see like, hey, you could have seen they were in here a week ago, two weeks ago, if it, this had been properly tuned or if you had a resource who was, you know, properly educated and trained on this tool to be at, able to identify these uh, PTPs and so on that are present within your technology. So, yeah, we see it a lot and it's yeah. it's really difficult. You know, we talk a lot about that from FR Secure's perspective that um, technology isn't security. And I think a lot of people, um, you know, unfortunately uh, fall into uh, the trap that I paid a lot of money for this technology or this device. So this is going to protect me now. Uh, those tools are only as good as you make use of them for. And so I'm sure you guys see the same thing a whole lot. Yeah, we have a, a, a new marketing slogan, um, which, you know, I'm not the biggest into marketing slogans, but it, it, it kind of hits home here. It's like, it's not a product problem. It's an operations problem. Mm -hmm. and, and as you said, like the products are getting smarter and smarter. They're doing a great job, but it does take a pretty highly trained person to start to interpret all of this and to be able mm -hmm. to correlate it. And, you know, I'm getting an alert from my firewall. Now I'm getting an alert from my endpoint, you know, and just being able to do that, it does take a de you know, dedicated resources who are not only, you know, know their stuff, but then are also constantly getting trained on the latest. So it, it, it takes a, you know, a highly, a highly trained individual to kind of yep. take, take this on. And it, like you said, it, what we've also seen is, you know, you install the product, you get that, you know, first week of training or first month of training, and then you never get any more time to get trained on that product again, because you're moving on to the next product that you're installing that again is going to produce more alerts. Right. And you have to figure those out. And so it just becomes a little overwhelming for, you know, especially like the, the small, the medium sized yeah. enterprise to take the handle of that. So, mm -hmm. and to give those folks a little bit of credit to and understanding and grace uh, for the people that often get tasked uh, with managing those technologies. Yeah. Um, they've got a hundred other, th other things to do as well. And, yeah. You know, I think a lot of business leaders have a difficulty understanding that that technology doesn't manage itself. When you pay for that technology, you need to also account for the resource uh, time and having an available resource to be able to manage that technology ongoing. I do think we're making progress. Uh, I think as we, you know, this year, as unfortunate as it has been in that ransomware attacks are through the roof um, and more and more people are seeing more and more people in the news. They're becoming more aware of that and thinking about it. So I think our message is starting to get out, uh, but there's still obviously a knowledge gap that I think we're all working on as security professionals to try to close that gap. And, you know, we want to help those IT admin out, the network admin out too. A lot of times it's unfair to put that burden of work on them on top of managing the uptime of their network, on top of managing the updates and patch cycles of all their technologies to say, hey, take this security stack and figure out how to use it too. It's just uh, overwhelming, inefficient, and uh, a poor use of those resources that you're spending lots and lots of money on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they get they just get burned out too, is, is the yeah. other thing. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're, again, like I was mentioning earlier, you're looking at that same alert every single day, and then it does turn into something and then someone blames you for not dealing with that. And you're like, yeah. what? You know, so yeah, yeah it's, <laughs> it, it, it's definitely a problem yeah. out there. Yeah, and we uh, see too, sometimes like, um, you know, folks, maybe they're tasked with managing these technologies and they are monitoring, but they don't necessarily understand those alerts, right? And that's kind of what you're saying, I think, where they're yeah. looking at that and maybe nine times out of 10, it was benign, but that one time out of 10, it wasn't benign. It was actually malicious and they don't have the expertise to disseminate the difference between those two alerts and what makes one benign and one malicious. And so, yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's a big challenge.
Yeah, or just not, to, I, I've also just, they just don't have the time to figure out what is normal in my environment, what is abnormal, right? And mm -hmm. um, just, yeah, d definitely yeah. takes dedicated time yeah. and resources to and the, the that. Two, the big thing before we hop on, you know, we talk about uh, yeah. alert fatigue and all these logs. And the other thing I, I talk to folks about a lot is just preserving your event logs and, uh, you know, and just the system of event logs. Um, those are incredibly value when I'm doing any sort of forensic investigation. If you have the ability to retrieve uh, a substantial history of your event logs, um, 80 to 90 percent of the time, that's going to give us the breadcrumb we need to be able to solve this case and determine that true point of ingress, determine all those touch points and the exploit path in the kill chain. And so that's something that's pretty cheap and free for people to do, too. I know cost is always a big issue, uh, but, you know, storage is getting cheaper and cheaper. And I tell folks, even if you can't afford the seam technology, even if you can't do all that today, you can back up those logs, put those logs on a, on a near line disk somewhere that's pretty cheap and retain those. Because if you ever do have the incident, when you do have an incident, unfortunately, that's becoming the new norm. Uh, those are going to be invaluable and, and helping you uh, understand how that happened and more so understand how we stop that from happening the next time around, too. Exactly. Having those logs are key. Um, and that that is one thing just to, to hit on the Arctic Wolf services we do. We store all of, all of those logs. We can store them for even up to 10 years for our customers. Typically don't need that long, but you know, we can store store those logs um, from each of those different security products and cloud products and, and all of that. So which yeah is is a key to uh, finding and doing the threat hunting and all of that. So um, I'm gonna go to our next poll uh, around patching, system patching. So how do you prioritize your system patching? Um, do you use vulnerability scanning? Do you do uh, pen testing to determine the, how to, pri again, how to prioritize which patches to apply? Um, do you yeah, patch all critical vulnerabilities on a periodic bat basis or ask, ask the magic eight ball? Which I had to throw in something funny, I guess there. <laughs> so whiskey talk, it looks like somebody yeah. recommended whistle pig boss hog. I have tried that. That's a very nice smooth rye. Um, I'm a fan of Rye's as well. I did say bourbon, but uh, bourbon and Rye, real close. I, <laughs> a lot yeah. of them come from down here too. If you're a Rye fan, I would uh, recommend the Willet Family Reserve Rye. If you haven't got to try that, uh, it's a it's a real tasty Rye. Again, it's a barrel proof. I think it comes in about one between 114 and 120. It is a little bit younger of a Rye. I think it's a, you can get a four year variant or a five year variant, uh, but uh, those are nice sipping Rye's too. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I haven't gotten into the rise too much. I've had, you know, a few from friends, but mm -hmm. yeah, I'll have to definitely check that out. Yeah, I see someone recommended the Angel Envy too. I do have a, actually a bottle right now, the Angel Envy Rye that uh, my friends from Minnetonka actually sent down to me last nice. week because, uh, or last month, uh, after a barrage of incidents where we worked what felt like uh, about <laughs> three weeks straight, <laughs> I think they knew I needed a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. All right. So it looks like uh, most people are patching all critical vulnerabilities on a periodic basis. So they have, you know, some type of um, schedule on, on getting those out. Um, and we have some uh, after that, some vulner uh, continuous vulnerability scanner, uh, some pen testing and then, yeah, asking the magic eight ball on the on these on these patches when when the patches. It, so, it, yeah, it, it has uh, obviously that is one of the main ways how hackers can exploit, you know, your environment is through taking advantage of operating system vulnerabilities, application vulnerabilities um, it is a big thing. And one of the things we saw through the SOC report is that since March, it's actually uh, our customers have taken an additional 40 days to patch critical vulnerabilities um, and again, you know, we don't have the exact reasons why, but, you know, us kind of thinking that through a little bit. Um, if we think about what was going on in the March timeframe and, and everyone going to, going to the work from home model, uh, IT and security teams being strained on implementing new products very quickly, imp implementing cloud solutions very quickly, patching, you know, unfortunately, it looks like has put it was put into, um, you know, one of the later items instead of more, one of the more critical items because they needed people to produce results, right, uh, as they're working from home. Um, how, how have you guys have seen that on your end, Oscar? Yeah, very similar. Um, yeah. You know, and again, a lot of our incidents aren't originating from those. We have seen some, you know, that do originate from, um, you know, missing some critical patches and exploits. Uh, but more so, we see that initial footholds gain, and they are able to continue to pivot through exploiting some of those missing patches. Um, so we're seeing that correlate. And the big thing I think about that too, um, the reason we got here, like you said, is 
we were surprised, right? <laughs> no one expected COVID. And yeah. so like, I think folks were never perfect at patching. We know that, but we were better at patching a year ago than we were today. And we were kind of forced into this, let's change our entire business model abruptly uh, without any sort of warning. And then as a flip side, everybody said, oh crap, now how do I manage these remote endpoints? Um, and a lot of businesses who weren't postured uh, for remote labor and workforce, uh, then had to quickly become postured uh, for remote system management. And um, yeah, it's a continued uh, challenge we do have. Uh, you know, one thing we go back to, it's not always our initial point of ingress, uh, but we do see still a lot of, you know, attackers through phishing techni techniques and so on that are abusing those RCEs and office suite. I've seen just to today, yesterday, yeah, Microsoft released their, uh, you know, round of patches last one of the year. I think there were nine criticals in there. Uh, on yeah. top of that, there were more RCEs that were discovered uh, within the office suite that if they weren't being exploited, they're certainly going to be exploited in the next few days. And how long do we think it's going to take for, you know, 90% of our workforce right now to be able to update that security or that office suite. Uh, so they're not going to be uh, vulnerable to those RCEs. I mean, it's, yeah the huge challenge and there will continue to be exploits because of that. And I, I almost, I mean, this is a little off topic, but I almost feel like Microsoft needs to release a version of word with that. This doesn't, doesn't have that. I mean, and I know you can keep disable it, but it feels like you just need to have a version that doesn't even have the capability to enable it at all. I know it prevents mm -hmm. some workforce. So there's a reason why it's there. There's a, a lot of uh, good that can come out of that, but it's just crazy how much, how many attacks are using uh, that remote code execution, you know, out of uh, Office is yeah. Maybe you know, make the every default, quarter. Maybe make the default is that you can't run macros, or the, and that's an add-on module. So if and you there's have no a, way to turn it on, yeah, there's no <laughs> yeah. way to turn it on. You can't enable it. Yeah. Uh, but if you want the module, we'll give you the module as a separate, uh, you know add-on for your office suite but then you know come on attackers are good social engineers they'll just they'll figure some. out the next thing i know yeah, it's you need to go put this add-on before you can see this sweet super secret document i just accidentally <laughs> sent to you <laughs> yeah 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 or uh you know your pay raise is included in this uh attachment here please open yeah. it up and yeah yeah i know it's that or pizza caught. coupons yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we have seen, um, <laughs> yeah, I guess we're going to get into fishing a little bit more. So I'll kind of hold off on that one. But yeah. Yep. Yeah, actually, um, what, we'll jump into, uh, I think, our, our last poll here. So what cloud server resources are you using today? AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, and you know potentially others. Again, we, as we were talking earlier, a lot of us have been forced to maybe move into more, you know, at least from a SaaS perspective, a lot more SaaS products that are you know hosted in the cloud, and we may not have been able to enable our you know single sign-on authentication right away. Um, something didn't quite work, but we needed to turn it on because they're you know uh, they are uh, people are working from home; they need access to it, and. Um, and then we just kind of wait and then that gets put on the back burner because now the next project has popped up and yeah we've 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 heard those stories you know through our our SOC teams from our you know our customers we we support they're just you know getting kind of kind of drowning in projects at this point mm -hmm. yeah i'm seeing a lot of folks too that are uh, migrating into these cloud environments and kind of going back to what we we're talking about with the security stack and technologies before but similar mentality where you know leadership has said hey this is the way we need to go without properly training their staff or having staff on that understands those technologies and through the implementation or migration to the cloud services inadvertently opening themselves to a whole new gang of risks just through a lack of understanding of secure implementation and configuration of those services so kind of the same old uh, song and dance right <laughs> yeah yeah i mean that i mean that, that brings up a, a a good point i don't have the the stat on this um well actually no i do it was nearly 50 percent of our security incidents that we are seeing does have some type of cloud component to it. Mm -hmm. um, so in some type of critical incident either, you know, came through the cloud or, mm -hmm. um, or uh, they, they made some type of uh, configuration change or, or uh, like uh, basically putting out something like an S3 bucket that was publicly exposed. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times what we've seen is actually, I mean, not to bash any particular groups, but developers have been kind of a, a key, um, a key risk uh, for some of our customers because they may hold a little bit more power than other groups because maybe their entire companies run through that web application, mm -hmm. um, and they're able to, you know, 
grab these resources and deploy them very quickly. So, you know, spin up these test environments that don't need that that don't typically go through the production uh, instance scrutiny that that uh, a test environment you know would wouldn't go through. So they don't you know have the right authentication. They don't have the right you know security controls and mitigations around those environments, and people are able to get in through there and they get access potentially to production instances. Yep. Um, yeah, I think it kind of shows overall too, and it's nothing against the developers. It's more yeah. of a immaturity and secure development life cycle, which is more than the developers, right? That takes yeah. Yeah. Uh, folks outside who are security experts who are reviewing your implementations, your changes in your code, and we see unfortunately that. Uh, most organizations are pretty in, uh, immature in developing those secure coding uh, life cycles, processes, and so on. Um, you know, I'm a big proponent of if you can do that, you're going to reduce your overall risk significantly in the long run, uh, not only by finding those inadvertent exposures, right, but having another set of eyes and a security minded personnel that's in that process that's able to obviously look at the code, uh, look at the application changes you're making, look at the network changes you're making, look at the supported architecture that you're running this on the, you know, the applications that are supporting this on the back end, making sure that those are not only securely implemented, but you're running non-vulnerable versions and updated versions uh, that don't have open active exploits. Um, we see that if you could develop a secure coding lifecycle, it would significantly reduce your chance of impact from uh, an exploit. Yeah, definitely. Even though it's going to add a little bit you know, more time, um, mm -hmm. but obviously dealing with that early than dealing with that later is, is yeah. way, way more beneficial. Yeah, and you know, just building that in too, like just doing some DAS scans on your application, your code as you're developing, like if you have the ability to do that uh, while you're in that development cycle, it gives you an opportunity while still being in the development cycle to fix bugs and to fix vulnerabilities as you're still developing the application. Whereas if it's a post review, it's always much more challenging to go back into the development cycle, uh, retest, go through that entire process again to fix those findings. So there's a lot of value in adding that in and Nick's absolutely right. It's more time initially, but in the long run, it's gonna lower your risk and also save you some time and heartache down the road. Definitely. Excellent. So moving on to the next uh, fifth out of the six items here is, is phishing and ransomware. So what we've seen from our SOC operation report is between Q1 uh, of 2020 of this year to Q2, there was a 20 or 64% 20, increase of critical threats, uh, such as ransomware and phishing attempts being made. And one of the interesting things is we saw actually a pretty big dip in March when COVID, you know, basically kind of emerged in overall attacks. Um, and then again, it had that pretty large increase after that. So it felt like uh, they were basically, um, kind of, it's not like they were taking a vacation or taking a break, right? They're making a lot of money off of this. I think they, they saw the opportunity. So they had to switch their tactics around and switch their fishing lures and, and way that they're going to get you to, um, you know, for, for them to be able to uh, send that ransomware payload is why we probably saw that dip is kind of what we're thinking. Um, and then again, they, they, once they got their tactics down, they, they unleashed and now it's just been basically a, a weekly occurrence of some new uh, ransomware attack. Is that kind of yeah. what you guys saw or what, how, how have things been or are yeah, secure? Very similar. I think that's what I yeah. touched on before. We had initially expected an immediate increase. We didn't see that. We seen a valley though. And then yeah. we see a kind of a delayed increase. And there's a lot of things at play. I think you're right. Um, I think there's a lot of enumeration opportunities for attackers, meaning like I mentioned before, 10 to 20% of our workforce is working remote to all of a sudden we got 80 to 90%. And um, so it was like, kind of like you're saying, you know, they went to a new body of water if they're fishing, if we're talking yeah. about real fishing and they had to survey yeah. that lake, you know, and understand yeah. uh, where the hot spots were going to be and how to target those. I think another thing that's really interesting that plays into this too, was there was kind of a truce that came out from some of our APTs, if you recall in the beginning of this saying, Hey, guess what? We're going to lay off healthcare. Uh, we're going to leave, uh, you know, hospitals yeah. out of this, every, anyone involved in the supply chain out of this and so on. Uh, well, it's real funny because if anyone remembers from just a few weeks ago, major headline all over the news with their the FBI was tracking and APT was targeting roughly 427 um, institutions within the healthcare sector. Um, and then we saw that. I mean, we observed that uh, we had a large uptick in our clients that were in healthcare sector uh, that were affected by that. And so I, I think that 
again, you know, these are not moral and ethical people by any means or any way. And so I think that they took out, they put out some big bait for a lot of folks within healthcare saying, you guys can relax. We're not going to target you right now. And I think we did see health, healthcare take a breath and step back because they had mother, other more important issues to uh, focus their attention on. And then we've seen them kind of say, uh, you know, in the last couple of months, uh, yeah, just playing, we're coming at you. <laughs> and I yeah. think that they use that as an opportunity about with the healthcare saying, oh, we're not going to be scrutinized as much. We're not going to be under pressure as much. They stepped back. The attackers seen that as an opportunity to go in, harvest information, establish footholds, lay low and plan a bigger attack. So they came in with a second wave and institutionalized all those things and all the things they've been learning about. We saw an uptick significantly, not just in you know, healthcare institutions that you would think of clinics and hospitals, but that entire supply chain. And I mean, everyone from researchers for vaccines, people who were developing and producing uh, test kits, even people, uh, people that were, you know, uh, manufacturing ventilators to people who were delivering those goods, every facet that got touched by that in the last couple months. And so, yeah, I think there's a lot going on. Like you said, there was a whole, you know, whole new slew of data for them to understand and, and, and study. Yep. Some people kind of relaxed. They took advantage of that and laid low. And then now we're seeing the the flip of that coin where things are upticking significantly. And I don't want to fear monger by any means. I'm just, you know, sharing what we've seen in the last few months. Yeah. And one of the things that we've also seen, um, and this has kind of happened actually over the last like year or so, so even more than this report is, is that they know that we're all backing up our systems. They know the way that we solve ransomware is, you know, re-image that machine, put that back up that was hopefully like an hour ago or something like that and get back up and running. They've become smart about that. So what, what we've seen them start to do is start to exfiltrate uh, of that data off of that machine and then potentially start posting that data information out uh, to the public. So if they're stealing you know, uh, public records or you know, PII information, start leaking pieces of that to let you know, hey, we have a larger piece of this. We have everything, here's 3% of that data um, and we're gonna go and expose all of this. So we don't care that you have a backup. We don't care that you're gonna get back up and running. We're gonna tarnish your image. We're gonna hurt your brand. We're gonna make people not trust you um, because we have all of your data. So. So they're, they're starting, you know, and again, these are, they're, they're trying to make money here. So they're trying to figure out our tactics that we're doing to com combat this. Um, and so what, you know, one of our recommendations is, to, you know, to see, to, to, you know, not just prepare for the ransomware attack, but to look for those early signs of ransomware or of a malicious actor or someone trying to elevate their permissions or, you know, going in further back to phishing and uh, business email compromise, you know, how are they actually getting access to that environment and putting a, a very heavy focus on that and taking those those things, those items very, very seriously, right? Yeah. Um, because that's how they get in and that's how they start, you know, to, to do these types, types of attacks. So mm -hmm. it's great to have great endpoint protection and, and you definitely should have that uh, to stop when ransomware does occur, but having, you know, the, the tools that see these early indicators is, is key or pen testing, right? That it, how are they going to be able to get in, right? Is mm -hmm. is a key type of item to help out. Yep. Yeah, we see the same stuff. Um, you know, like Maze has been the big public shaming group. Yeah. Um, some other copycats have started adopting that model too, and it's essentially blackmail. I mean, yeah. they're saying, "Hey, big deal. You can recover. Uh, we can still prove that you're own, and we're going to post all your records and share yep. those records, and we're going to prove we can do it." Um, it's very unfortunate. Um, you know, that's why protecting from you know having the initial uh, compromise is so important. Another thing on top of that, and you mentioned too, like, you know, that we see in about um, 75 to 80% of all our ransom attacks is uh, your backups are destroyed before they encrypt your environment. I'm sure you guys yeah. see that too, you know? Yeah. And so attackers are smart, like Nick said, and, and they know we're backing up. So we see high dwell times. And sometimes that dwell time is them enumerating your network, doing recon, identifying where your backups exist, all those backup endpoints, and making sure they have a mechanism or a means to destruct those backups before they ever launch the actual payload, which is gonna be the encryption of your infrastructure. Uh, so one thing I've been pushing hard to all of our clients and anyone I get a chance to talk to is the importance of developing an air-gapped backup solution uh, or an offline backup solution. Yeah. Even if that air-gap or offline, you're, you may have a delay. Maybe you can only do that once a week. 
but still like you're going to be a lot better off losing yeah. one week of data than you are all of your data when you find out all your data is gone. And the other thing, you know, that people can't rely on these attackers actually giving you sufficient decryptor keys when you are encrypted. Um, we see attackers make mistakes. We see attackers, um, I, mean, I was working with a client recently and it's very unfortunate. Their backups were destructed. Uh, so they had no, no way to restore. They have to go into negotiations with the attacker to get that data back. Um, and then we learn uh, from the FBI that the group is on um, known terrorist organization lists. And so uh, you're prohibited uh, by federal law uh, to send any sort of uh, currency payments to those attackers. Wow. And so what that meant for our client is their data was gone. There was no recovering that. Uh, and they were forced with a, you know, a very tough business decision or acceptance of a reality that we've lost years of work there's nothing we can do about it. We have to start all over again. And so when I say like, get the air gaps offline backup solution in place. I mean, even if it's, you know, pulling that old LTO library out of the closet, you guys retired three years ago, go get it, pull it out, put some stuff on tape, put those, put those tapes in a vault somewhere. Um, because, um, the, you know, the backups are a critical piece of this kill chain now, and we're seeing it on nearly every attack. The only ones we don't see it on are drive-bys and drive-bys are few and far between. And what I mean by drive-bys is the mean dwell time less than four hours, meaning you're exploited, they get into your network, they do a quick scan, they encrypt everything they can, they get out. Uh, those are really sloppy attacks. Uh, but most of our attacks, they have a significant dwell time. They've been in your environment for around a month or more, minimum in most cases. I'm sure you've got some stats on that, Nick. Yeah. Uh, and the reason they're dwelling is because they wanna make sure they do it right and they're gonna hit you where it hurts. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they, it, um, yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. Like it's majority of these large attacks, they've been in your environment for, you know, I, it's 200 plus days. I can't remember the exact day, but they, you know, basically seeing how high of an account uh, access uh, can they get, um, trying to see what type of activities occurring, what's moving in and out of your network. When is, when is the best time to attack? Um, and because they want to get the most money out of that. Right. So it, it is what, what their goal is. Yeah. Uh, I think they learn yeah. a lot about the organization being in that long too, because they know, uh, you know, there's, there's opportunity even after that ransom for follow-up attacks. So they can learn your business processes where your financial transactions are occurring and so on get targets within that group, those entities within your organization, maybe it's your finance department, they learn those, those pieces of information. So after that ransom events over, and they exploit, they've still got targets in your organization that they can target through different avenues of attack uh, while you're responding to the initial ransomware event. So we see that so much, I'm sure you guys see it too, Nick, that um, if we're able to get in and stop, uh, you know, persistent threat in a network, um, they're hammering, hammering the people through continuous phishing uh, nonstop while we're in there trying to respond to the incident. Uh, they're continually trying to get another foothold in. So it's, you know, it becomes yeah. playing whack-a-mole. <laughs> it's because they've also invested very heavily in that attack. And so mm -hmm. you, you finding you, you know, exploiting and or, or seeing that they're in there, that persistent attacker and trying to stop them. They're, they're mad now. And so they're yeah. going to do whatever they can to at least get something out of this whole, mm -hmm. um, you know, attack that they've been trying to perform for, you know, 200 yep. plus days. Right. Yep. Um, and, and it goes back to some of the other points that we made is just making sure that you have, you know, good you, processes in place that you've, you know, run through a, an exercise or, you know, your, uh, a ransomware exercise, right. Uh, you've run through, you, you have some type of uh, phishing email campaign uh, occurring where you're, you're testing against, you know, um, uh, different uh, phishing links. So you kind of know maybe where your most vulnerable people are uh, that can get exploited. Um, you know, trying to get ahead of this uh, as much as possible is going to, is going to help um, obviously deal with when the situation does arise, uh, being able to deal with it quickly. Yep. Yeah. So one thing on that, a free tool that we have, that uh, you know, we'll send out after this is over, we got a ransomware readiness assessment. Um, you can do that yourself. We can help you with it if you want us to. Uh, but it's a really good exercise, just like Nick's talking about to go through self assess your business, determine if you are ready to respond to a ransomware uh, event. And then it also it'll teach you a lot of things, uh, things that you can be doing today to prevent your likelihood of having a significant impact through a ransomware attack. So uh, we'll get that out to you guys and hopefully you get some value out of that. Excellent. So we're on to our last kind of point from the Arctic Post SOC report here is, 
is connections to unsupported or sorry, unsecured and open Wi-Fi connections have increased by close to 250% during this kind of first uh, half of, of 2020. Um, and you know, this one had, was somewhat interesting. I, when I first read this, I, I wasn't like, oh, I w it didn't blow me away or anything like that. But then I, I started to, to think about it a little bit more. And I was like, well, the reason why this is occurring is because we're all working from home. Um, we're all connecting um, you know, to our home Wi-Fi's. Maybe people have beefed up their Wi-Fi's and, and increased so that they can work, you know, out of their basement, and they may, weren't able to work out of their basement, which kind of happened to me. I had to go and get a new mesh network. But, um, you know, just in, but then when you are installing these, you know, new tools, um, you know, making sure that you're you're changing, you know, obviously this sounds sounds a very basic, but changing the passwords right on your Wi-Fi networks, making sure you're enabling encryption. Um, you know, all of the, those do sound, you know, very basic, but sometimes I, I, what we've seen is, uh, you know, people allow, you know, maybe their kids to set up their Wi-Fi or um, they set it up very, very quickly because they need to, you know, get to work because they're working from home and they just haven't dug into it. Um, and and now you're kind of leaving yourself open. You're not, you know, not the easiest way for them. You know, it, it's, it's, it's somewhat hard for attackers to attack corporate data centers, right? That we have firewalls in place. We have, you know, lots of different um, mitigating factors to stop them. But now that we're not there, we're at home behind, you know, a home-based router. It's a little bit easier to get at our endpoints and maybe potentially get in through that endpoint through the VPN into these corporate data centers. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's we've seen a lot more, you know, a, a large increase, which obviously exposes, you know, our 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 businesses that we're working for to you know, more attacks because there is a, a, a more of an open front door. Yeah. A thousand percent completely agree with that, Nick. Um, it's, uh, it's tough. Again, it goes back to kind of what we were talking about before we, we had that quick shift, right. And no one really thought about how important it was at that time for making sure your users knew how to have a secure home network, but businesses quickly figured out, um, because you know, Nick's right. You know, those things are, are risks for essentially paths into the corporate networks and paths into your business network. Um, and so we got to focus on educating our people. I think that's a critically important thing moving forward with anyone who's involved in this. And hopefully anyone who's listened to this understands that, um, you know, we all know that our people are our weakest link. Um, and the only thing we can do is try to educate people. And hopefully that's, you're getting some value out of this today. I know that's one of my big goals is to try to help people learn and understand more. Um, I will say again, we're big here at, you know, giving out free tools to people and free resources to people that can help you teach yourself some things. Um, we have a free assessment from our, our partner, sister company, security studio, it's S2 me. We'll get that link to you guys as well. It's totally free. And it's like a personal security assessment. You can do completely anonymous. And it'll go through a lot of these best practices that you, you know, Nick's talking about on how to secure your home network and make sure you understand those things you should be doing on your, your home network and when you're configuring that home router uh, to lower your likelihood of, of being a victim and then your business being a sequential victim because of that. Um, so that's something else we'll kick out to you guys and hopefully you get some value of that. Um, I would say too, you know, Nick, another thing I always recommend is set up two networks at home. Um, you know, have your business stuff just on one segment that only you use. You don't let your kids on, you don't let your family on it. No one else. You just do your business on your own network and everything else is segmented. The other thing I tell folks too, is, uh, you know, once a week or once, a, uh, you know, every two weeks, whenever you can log into your device, your router and make sure, you know, every device that's connected to it, you know, and I've you're going to learn a whole lot. Yeah. yeah. You'll yeah. learn a lot because I know even myself, you know, I'll log on and be like, what the hell is this? Oh, okay. All right. That's my print. <laughs> you yeah. know? But it's good to just go through the exercise. Uh, so you can, uh, you know, be certain that everything that's on your network is supposed to be on your network. And it's rather simple. You don't have to be a tech expert to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually looked at mine recently. It was like 34 devices. I was like, holy crap. And you know, I did the same thing. I, a couple of them were just like device names and I had no yeah. idea what they were. Um, but yeah. one of the things like I, I do uh, is also put you know, your IOT devices on a separate, on a separate mm -hmm. network. Right. So yep. I, I have a ring and I have a nest camera and I just make sure that those are separate, complete separate network than, than anything mm -hmm. else, just from a security standpoint yep. and making, and making sure multi-factor authentication is turned on wherever it can be um, on mm -hmm. IOT devices, especially. Yeah, for sure. MFA everywhere all day. Yep. <laughs> exactly. 
Awesome. Well, this kind of concludes uh, the, the six items that we wanted to review from that Arctic Wolf SOC report. Um, what we'll be doing is sending that out. I think it was the link was sent out via the chat, but we'll also uh, email that out to everyone who attended here. So you can kind of get a little deeper dive and be able to review some of these uh, different findings and some of our recommendations from those findings that, you know, we kind of reviewed here during this call. But you know, I wanted to, you know, thank FR Secure and thank you, Oscar. Uh, I've learned a lot about security and I learned a little bit about whiskey and, you know, hey, <laughs> like, that's always that's always a good time. So, yeah, fantastic. I, uh, I would let everybody know before I forget, Jess will get real mad at me. Uh, <laughs> we are offering our instant response risk registration uh, for free for all of our attendees today. That's typically a thousand bucks. And so we'll send out that link. That means you can log on. Uh, we'll essentially go through a coaching session with you guys on your instant response preparedness. Uh, we'll have you set up. So if you have an incident, you can call us and we'll give you some free coaching. So it's a, uh, it's a Christmas gift. Why not do it? Um, <laughs> and then also we're going to share our instant response plan template. I know a lot of people need instant response plans and don't have them today. Uh, we think that's something people should have for free and have the knowledge for free to do. Uh, so we'll put that in the email and send that out to you guys. And again, it's like the ransomware readiness. If you want us to help you, we'll certainly help you. Uh, but we'll give you that power and the knowledge to do it on your own. Call us if you need us. And uh, yeah, Nick, it's been awesome talking to you today, man. Uh, learned a lot. And yeah. uh, hopefully, yeah. yeah, happy holidays, everybody. Thanks for yeah, joining. Happy holidays. See you guys.